well done. I'm taking you on the tour. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's really good, actually. Um, I, want, I want to start uh, first by uh, saying thanks for all y'all coming out. It's a real special day for me. I see a lot of friends here, friends we've had for a long time. Larry been been together a long time, and uh, I wouldn't be anywhere near here if I hadn't been for y'all from the very start. And now, of course, it all begins with Lynn, who is the brains of our family, right here. <laughs> Everybody knows that. Uh, she, uh, she, she really is. Uh, she's our, the true kitchen cabinet for me, and uh, uh, all of our decisions are, are, are made in that in that fashion. And son Mark, who is a four-day-old father. <laughs> <laughs> And he's a really good tax lawyer. He's right here. <laughs> he's got standing right here. He's got two children to support, so he needs work. Uh, and we were particularly uh, blessed, and this will lead to what we're going to talk about today, but we were particularly blessed uh, to uh, look at, uh, you know, Mark's new baby. And so the new, the new baby is uh, named Howard Delver Coast. And mercifully, they're going to call him Howard. <laughs> I'll y'all tell you that. So, little Howard, you know, we're holding little Howard in, in the hospital Saturday, just an hour a after birth. And you, you sit there, and every time, this is the seventh grandchild for Lynn and I, every time you sit there and you think, what's his future? You know, what's, what's Mississippi going to look like? You know, where, where have we been? How is it going to be for him? You know, and the others that we have four daughters, four, four girls and three boys. And what, what's that going to be like? And we remember uh, today, I was just thinking about this and talking to somebody about when Lynn and I came to Mississippi, uh, we had college debt that we brought with us and a car. And everything we owned was in that car. And we took it over to the Vucare Apartments, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, and rented an apartment and started out. The only problem with that was the car was leased. So I had to take it back to the Jackson Airport here. So we had to hitchhike to work the first month. And to show you how round the world is, all of you who have friends, cherish your friends because they come back around. Lynn's job was as secretary to the president pro tem of the Mississippi Senate. She worked in the Capitol. And I will tell you, it has never been better run than when Lynn ran. <laughs> Y'all listen, all these senators are here, they know that's true. So maybe when we get back, we hope to uh, be as successful as Lynn was when we started out here, you know, 50 years ago. But we've raised our family here, we have our, our three children, our grandchildren are here, and so we started looking at where we're going in the future. And we, Jim has took about the first five minutes of my talk coming out good we had done already. Um, it was important. It was important to get a billion dollars for public education. It was important to have voter ID and not be sued. I saw a poll the other day, 81% of Mississippians favor voter ID now. Those things were important. The business were important. So what we wanted to do was where can we next go? What can we next do best? What, what can our talents be? That little Howard will grow up and be proud of his grandparents. So when we looked about, when we started looking at that, there are things. And most of the things uh, are attacked or are affected by the lieutenant governor, with, without question. The lieutenant governor and the speaker have so much control of the budget and the statutory scheme, and the members of the Senate are here to help them have them here. They, that is the most important job, to do the things that you want to have accomplished in Mississippi. Uh, you, are, you have your hand on the button with that. And that's where I want to go. I want to apply for the Lieutenant Governor's job. And we're going to apply here, and we're looking forward to being there. I, um, I have an agenda. Uh, Y'all will know it. Educated workforce is the top one. I see the head of the Heinz Junior College is out here in the back. The educated workforce will be one of the, one of the things I spend half my time on. I anticipate that we will have an educated workforce. Jim's right. People that have come to work that he has trained here, a lot of them will end up making more money than the Secretary of State does. A good, well-paying jobs. We can do that. Seventy percent of our, our young men and women don't get a bachelor's degree, but we want them all to get a job. So what you'll see is an emphasis on educated workforce. We've been going all over the state of Mississippi doing that. We were in Lowndes County the other day. We were in Hattiesburg with a, a hundred businesses and, and, and high schools and others talking about how can we get those young men and women up to having a skill set 
And I'm telling y'all, everybody that's in the robotics class in school is going to get a job. You know, the guy that can make the three-pointer or score the touchdown on Friday night, they're probably not going to play in the NFL. But all the rest of them are going to have a job, and we need to have a job for them that allows them to support their families and, ha and have a meaningful commitment to the state of Mississippi and to themselves and to their families. So that educated workforce will be a, a major part of what we will start working to do. And we will work to bring our community college systems and our high schools together uh, and our workforce together. When I was at one of these meetings, y'all, I was standing there and uh, the individual who was running the, the CTE program, the Career Technical Institute program, said, you know, uh, after the businesses had given this conversation, they said, you know, I didn't know that. I wish y'all would have called me. And, and right before we started, I was with the business manager who said, you know, the schools never call us about anything. You know, they won't give us the workforce that we really need. And I thought, we need to get those people together. You know, they need to be talking. So I think you'll see us emphasizing that. We, uh, I think we have 200 mm -hmm. agency boards and commissions in Mississippi. 200 of them. And we started in 1890, and we started adding on, and we're still adding on. So I want to tell you, we're not going to have 200 agency boards and commissions. When, we, when you call the Secretary of State office today, within 10 seconds, 98% of the time, somebody picks up the phone who's, who's excited that you call. All the state ought to be run that way. The taxpayers pay for us. We're, we're, they're our customers. You know, We ought to answer the phone, and we ought to be organized so that the citizens of the state of Mississippi can get the very best uh, from their government just unilaterally where they can look and know who to call and, and it's all streamlined down into what's effective. And there are a number of different things. I've been working on that for over five years with the Stennis Institute and other institutes of how we would structure state government to be just like we're talking about. It needs to be receptive to the government and to the people who pay their, pay their salaries. You'll see a good bit of that. <clears throat> We've been all over health care. We have been to most of the hospitals in Mississippi, and some of them work exceptionally well in little bitty places you wouldn't think. Ruleville, the Ruleville Hospital in some of the poorest parts of the state is runs well, exceptionally well. I mean, they run a commercial, take me to Ruleville if I get sick, <coughs> you know, in the, poorest, in the poorest county in Mississippi. So we have, we have a dichotomy there between some hospitals are not working in rural Mississippi and the need for health care around Mississippi. How we met, merge those? Brookhaven has a very good, a very good hospital system. Some towns don't. So how do we merge it where people have access to health care? There's so many things we want to do in Mississippi, and I think we can make it better for Howard. I think we can make it better for every citizen. It's your future, and it's our future, and I intend to be a part of it. Now I'm gonna stop. You know, we have a whole bunch of bright people in here, and I see, hey, Pam, you see so so many friends. Make sure I get a chance to talk to you before I get up. Got out to that. Any questions from the press? <coughs> we'll start. You want to start? Yeah, a lot of uh, it's coming. You know, you hear more and more just now. That people are asking about the building trades coming back to the school systems. You know, all over the state, and uh, you're seeing, you know, that been offered. You know, the junior colleges, but the high schools. Would you like to see that put back in the schools with welding, building, uh, you know, all woodworking, and all that? It's called career technical. Institute and just just what we were talking about 70% of Mississippians won't have the ability to, to have a collegiate education and, and many of them will not need that to prosper So what you will see is what's going on in Lowndes County where we now have a hands program Where businesses are interning individuals? Uh, Baldwin where you go out the front door of the Baldwin high school and a, and they have a small bell metal building inside of it is the exact replica of a Toyota plant and a robot, and the kids are all running the robot in there. Uh, and, and in um, Hattiesburg, uh, we probably had a hundred different people in there talking about businesses getting involved primarily in the school system. <clears throat> that whole thing will go. We need four-year-old education in Mississippi. We only have like 1,700 of our kids in public education, and the governor has got a grant just recently to help with that. Uh, you'll see education begin from that fourth year public through wherever you need to exit the education system to get to your job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Most likely that will be at least a 13th year. So you'll see all of us start to work together to collapse that education system from four year old all the way to the top without having different fights in different places. <clears throat> Very important. 
to the future of the state. It was a movie that said, um, if you build it, they will come. I believe we have an educated workforce, we'll have people come here. And you can see the individual businesses taking their own time and money by KLLM to make that happen. Uh, yes, sir. Have you talked to the governor <coughs> uh, and lieutenant governor at all about your campaign? Do you expect to get their endorsement? And if you do, do you plan any coordination with uh, the lieutenant governor? Well, we have, uh, we have told the governor and the lieutenant governor and then a whole bunch of other people that were running for lieutenant governor, so I haven't kept that a secret, uh, except for the press, no offense. <laughs> uh, the governor has been one of the hardest working governors we've ever had, Phil Bryant. I mean, when I, when I, I'm, I'm, I stay late, and uh, the last light on in, in the Capitol is Phil, uh, just time after time. His travel schedule and his work schedule is uh, legendary to me. I would very much appreciate his endorsement and help, and I hope to get it. On <clears throat> at campaigns, the campaigns are individualized, I think. I mean, I think everybody runs for their own office. And in, in my case, I'm in a unique position. <clears throat> I'm a member of the legislature, and I'm in the executive branch. We have three, and I'm in, I'm in two of them. So, <clears throat> you know, lieutenant governors and everything, but the judicial branch. I think that uh, connotates a separate campaign, <clears throat> and so I'll be running my own. Can you talk a little more about why you chose to run for lieutenant governor, and did you ever consider running for another office such as the governor instead? We, we started looking at this last year, Bobby, um, about what to do in the future when it became evident that <clears throat> voter ID had occurred, our business laws had been redrafted, um, so many of the things that I started have been done. <clears throat> When we considered um, what to do in the future, uh, I wanted to go where I could make the most difference. And uh, controlling the budget and all of the laws, which has historically been in the Senate and the House, <clears throat> was where I could make the most difference. Um, I recognize that we, you know, there are other, there are other things where it'd be a better ego and you get your, um, you get your picture portrait put in the Capitol and stuff, but that, that's less important to me. I want, I want to do where I think I can have my hand on the button and make Mississippi better. And the Lieutenant Governor's spot is, is the spot. Oh, you were late, girl. Where have you been? <laughs> we're gonna wait for you here. You'll never get angry if you go there. Um, any other questions? For press anybody? Anybody we can answer? I'm gonna visit. We got so many friends here. This is unbelievable. Y'all came out on a work day and came out to help us get started. And I so appreciate everybody coming. Lynn and I do. It's a long journey. It's a big state. And uh, we'll leave here. We'll be in Columbus and Tupelo and DeSoto today. Meridian on the coast tomorrow, Hattiesburg. We'll be all over telling and listening to what people need in Mississippi. We're going to make this a better place. Mississippi will be better after we get it. Y'all will just hang with me. I've always subscribed to the fact that you should never say, we've always done it that way. Just hang with me uh, on, way, on what we're going to be doing in Mississippi. And I, and I promise you, four years from now, you won't be disappointed. So thanks, everybody. Thank